Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. There are non-game birds and mammals in Wyoming, and that's a responsibility of the non-game program at the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And that's what we'll learn about next on Wyoming Chronicle. When people think about the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, it's traditionally maybe elk, trout, antelope, deer, but there's also a non-game program, and that's what we're here to learn about. Today with me is Zach Walker, the non-game bird and mammal supervisor, and Nicole Bjornley, a non-game mammal biologist. Welcome both of you to Wyoming Chronicle. Uh, Zach, let me start with you. Um, what is the, what is the non-game program? It's something that, that I think many people in Wyoming may not even know exists. Yeah, so basically the non-game program, uh, it, it's all those animals and species that are otherwise non-classified. So kind of what you said, you know, if you think about the, um, the big game, the elk, the deer, those are considered game animals. You have fur bears, um, and then you have um, so pest and different species like that are classified by statute or through or our game and fish regulations. And basically the non-game covers everything that's not, not classified. Um, Give me some examples of species that you're responsible for. Um, so some examples of the species that I work with, it's everything from some of the smaller birds, the migratory uh, birds such as, you know, uh, burrowing owls, uh, ferruginous hawks, uh, trumpeter swans, we also do wolverines, even smaller uh, mammals such as the prebles jumping mouse. You know, it covers qu quite a wide uh, variety of, of uh, species and taxa. So. I want to tell our viewers that we'll talk specifically about wolverines a little later in this program, but I'm curious, um, Nicole, how do you determine which species you work with. There are, there are so many, and, and there are a few resources, few dollars, few people. How do you determine? Mm -hmm. Well, about two-thirds of our mammal species in Wyoming are actually classified as non-game. Um, and all told, we've got hundreds of species in the bird and mammal program. And so we use a variety of different ways to determine what species we're going to work with. Um, we work quite a bit with threatened and endangered species. We work with species that are locally important for Wyoming, so things like uh, the Wyoming pocket gopher is an endemic in the state, um, found nowhere else in the world um, other than in Wyoming. Species that may be declining, species that we don't know very much about, and so we're just trying to get a handle on where they are and how they're doing. Um, there's a lot of different different ways that we tackle that. And then, so who makes the priority list? Who, who, who determines? Um, what what the where the work's gonna gonna happen? Is that your job, Zach, primarily? Or? Um, yeah, at least I have something to say about it. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of it happens. It depends um, kind of on what's going on. So a lot of things develop kind of at the biologist mm -hmm. level. So for example, Nicole would see like a different issue with the species, or kind of keep track, have a pulse on how things are doing more on a, a regional level, and then a lot of that will come up, and then you know we kind of come up with some ideas of what needs to be done. I'll discuss that with a uh, higher up in the wildlife division uh, administration. And then usually at that point in time, we kind of get a um, approval or a buy-in, and then that kind of helps us decide on, on what we're gonna do. Now, primarily we're talking about the mammal part of the non-game program today, but there's also the birds and fisheries. Um, program here in Wyoming. Is that correct? That is correct. So the bird, um, the bird program is still underneath uh, my supervision. So we have a, a bird biologist, which would be uh, Nicole's counterpart, and then we have a regional biologist who does a lot of bird work and a little bit of mammal work as well in Jackson and Pinedale. Um, the fisheries is responsible for reptiles and amphibians in, in the fish, and that happens kind of over on their side of the, the divisions. Now, do states generally pay the same amount of attention to non-game species like Wyoming does or are there do states place different priorities on on administering their non-game programs yeah a lot of states have different um, kind of priorities on that there's some states that may not put as much and there's some states that put more um, it's really kind of uh, dependent on on which program you're looking at and I think our viewers would be interested to know how is the non-game program funded here in Wyoming 
Yeah, so the program here in Wyoming is funded through uh, gener the general fund through legislative dollars, and so basically all of our uh, operational costs are handled, um, again, through the general fund. We also get a lot of uh, federal grants. We get stuff through the state wildlife grants. Um, we have some programs funded through the governor's ESA account, and even some that are through competitive state wildlife grants. So um, it's quite quite a variety of, of different sources, but by and large, at least the basic uh, operating is, comes out of the legislative fund. Nicole, you work a lot with the Black-Footed Ferret Program, mm -hmm. and there may be some news this summer about that program. Yes. Share that with us. Um, we have been working with the Fish and Wildlife Service to move forward with reintroducing ferrets back to Matitsi, Wyoming. Um, this is the last known native population of black-footed ferrets, and any ferrets that we currently have in the wild all the way from Mexico to Canada are descendant from those individuals that were originally removed from Matitsi. So assuming that the ferrets cooperate with us and that we get some kits this year, uh, we're hoping to put some back out on the areas where we originally found them so we can reestablish a population there. And they're actively managed then still on Seville Canyon? No, right now um, there are a number of breeding facilities around the country. The primary breeding facility is actually based out of Colorado. Um, it's a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service run facility um, and all ferrets have to go through a um, training program, if you will, um, make sure that they're capable of finding and catching and killing prey before we put them back out. So most of our ferrets will likely come from Colorado. And you expect that decision to be made soon? Hopefully, mm -hmm. yep. So we are, um, we know that they have all um, been bred, so we're just kind of waiting at this point to see how many young we have that are actually produced and make it through the program. Zach, what's also top of the list here with the Wyoming Game and Fish non Game Program? Obviously the, the, the black-footed ferret is, is, is one of particular importance. What else do you spend a lot of time with? Well, right now, this winter, we spend a lot of time uh, with the Wolverine uh, program for the occupancy modeling that we're working on with other states. Um, and during the summers... You occupancy know, modeling, it sounds like we're in an apartment project, but you're yeah. trying to understand how many? Is that is that what you're trying to understand? Yes, exactly. Huh? How many are uh, are with throughout the range, um, throughout basically the, the um, range in the Idaho, Washington, and, and Montana, and Wyoming, and to see basically how much Wolverine habitat is occupied. So. So if um, the black-footed ferret is a success program, what other success programs has the non-game program had recently, would you say? So, um, well, there's a couple different things that we, we've had. So and one thing that can just comes up to the top of my head is we've done a lot of uh, work with uh, peregrine falcons, and those have just came off the list. And actually, last year was our last year of um, post delisting um, monitoring and it still seems like they're doing fine in the state and so uh, we're pretty happy with that program you know we'd still like to keep our finger on the population but you know that's something that's that's occurred here as well um, and another thing we we've seen um, we've done a lot of work with trumpeter swans throughout Wyoming and it seems like those are starting to, to come back as well I must imagine that climate um, drought climate change those things impact your ability to do your work have they impacted um, um, what it is that you do? Yeah, um, so prairie dogs, especially all small mammals, in the last few years have rebounded quite a bit. Um, we've gotten a little bit of water and it's done wonders for um, all of our species here in the state, but we've seen declines in prairie dog numbers, um, prairie dog occupancy, and especially in relation to potential now many black. people would be cheering that. Yes, that yes. News. yes. But um, the, some of those concerns come in with areas where we do have ferrets. And if we have fewer prairie dogs, we have fewer prey items available for ferrets. So being able to keep track of some of those populations, making sure that we've got that adequate prey base for our predator populations, such as those black-footed ferrets, is really important. And we have seen that Small mammals, prairie dogs, mice, et cetera, all respond um, very well to increased moisture and all decline quite a bit when we have years of drought. Zach, what's the history of the non-game program in Wyoming? It hasn't been around forever. Um, when did it evolve? 
Yeah, so the project, the program started back in the 70s, uh, about 77. And basically it started as a um, understanding of the need that we have to look at more than just probably the game species. Um, in the early 80s, uh, that also kind of evolved as we started seeing some of these more species were listed for federal petitions. Um, the blackfoot ferrets were rediscovered in Wyoming. So there was a number of different um, you know, concerns that are coming up that need to be addressed and we just need a new personnel to, uh, to deal with those issues. Is there, and maybe this isn't the right word, tension between the game and non-game um, portions of the Game and Fish Department? You work together, do you have common goals? <clears throat> Funding now in Wyoming is going to become an issue and it has become an issue. Um, how does the program work together and is it, it isn't the case, is it that it's one or the other? It needs to be both, I would assume you, you would say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I would say. And um, it seems like the, the game and the non-game, you know, there is definitely an emphasis put upon game species here in the state, and that's because a lot of the dollars that are generated by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department are from hunters and anglers. Um, so, you know, there's definitely going to be some um, focus on those species. However, there's... Um, I always see it kind of uh, working with the non-game is kind of an investment in the future, uh, especially when it comes to those species that might be on more of a federal uh, stage. But um, you know the the night game and the non-game work together fairly well. For example, you know if there's different issues that we have in the regions, we do work with regional personnel and we we do get each other to help help out with uh, programs. For example, we're doing grassland bird surveys and a lot of the uh, game biologists and uh, regional personnel will come out and help us do surveys um, to get more information. So, um, you know, there is that, that kind of synergy that goes together with it, but definitely when it comes to funding, there is a little bit of a, a, a difference on emphasis placed depending on where the money's coming from. Nicole, you, um, <clears throat> I, I assume, work statewide, but also regionally in some of the programs that you're involved with? Um, we will, when we've got species that are more regional, we'll work with our regional personnel um, fairly closely. For example, to keep coming back to ferrets, um, you know, those are very localized populations. We'll work very closely with regional personnel when we come to those types of situations. Um, Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse is another one that's um, more regional. We've only got it in the southeastern quarter of the state, so we'll work with regional personnel for that. They help us a lot with um, bat surveys and different types of things that we've got. People might out. be surprised that the Game and Fish works with bats. Yes. Okay, so why is that? Um, so Wyoming has 18 species of bats, actually, when we include species that are somewhat peripheral or may accidentally show up here um, but may not have breeding populations. So quite a few, a decent chunk of our non-game mammals are actually bats. Um, and there's a lot of interest in bats because they are, all of our bats are um, insectivorous and so they help control insect populations, insect pests. Um, and there's also been concern with white nose syndrome, um, which is caused by a cold loving fungus, which actually causes bats to wake up during hibernation, expend their energy, and then they die from um, either exposure or starvation. So we don't have that yet in Wyoming, but it's steadily progressing westward and so one of the best things we can do is know how our healthy bat populations are right now. So when that gets here, we can keep track of it. Zach, I'm curious, <clears throat> um, the future of the non-game program, obviously there's, there's a ton on your plate now. What do you envision in the next five to 10 years as being the central focus of the non-game program? Well, that's a very good question. Um, so, you know, of course, there's definitely things that we're going to be working on into the future. So, you know, black-footed ferrets is one. Uh, we'll continue working probably with trumpeter swans, um, with um, swift fox, with uh, prairie dogs, especially if we, as we continue um, ferret populations. Um, Preble's jumping mouse, I expect us to do a lot of monitoring for that in the future. I think probably the next big thing, though, um, is probably something that I don't even see coming. Um, a lot of times our priorities are built upon federal issues, um, and I'm sure probably in the next five or six years something will get petitioned, and that will be the, the brush fire that we're going to have to deal with. So. <laughs> Always, it's kind of always out there, a, a, a big fear. Have you ever been working on a project that you've just had to put the brakes on for whatever reason and, and just, just start something else, either for funding, either for natural disaster or any other, any other um, types of anomalies that weren't planned for? 
You know, a, a lot of times um, we've been able to complete the projects that we at least start, um, but we might have plans to, to kind of follow up with some of that and then the priorities have changed. Um, so for an example of that would be, you know, we were working with water voles up in the Bighorn Mountains. Um, we did a year's worth of work on that and then some of the priorities shifted. We didn't get more money and then this year we we're able to pick it back up and kind of go um, back towards that. So, you know, stuff, stuff like that does happen occasionally. I assume the Endangered Species Act um, guides some of what you do. Um, give me an example of, 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 of that, of, about how it impacts what you do day to day. Um, so one of the big species that we'll have coming up is the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse. Um, so we are in the process of doing recovery planning and so... Is that the longest mouse name, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> it might be. <laughs> um, so we're in the process of putting together a recovery plan for that species, and that's going to involve monitoring, and it's going to likely involve annual monitoring. Um, so that will help influence what we do when we put together our work schedule year to year. Um, another one that kind of popped up recently is a petition to list a subspecies of the eastern spotted skunk. Um, one species that you know we know we have but haven't put much emphasis on until now, um, and so once that petition came up, um, you know, we started figuring out we need to figure out what's going on here in the state with that species. And so that really changed our direction and we put forth a proposal to do some work with that and we'll be working with University of Wyoming um, to kind of get a handle on that species. Off camera we talked about your relationships with landowners. Mm -hmm. Very important yes. to what you do. Um, tell me why and, and, and how does that work, your relationships with landowners in Wyoming? So in Wyoming, we're very fortunate to have these big swaths of fairly untouched land, and that's primarily due to our agriculture and ranching heritage here in the state. Um, and so working with landowners is critical because uh, wildlife depend on the lands that those folks manage. Um, so we work with landowners extensively to go out and survey for populations. Um, I We've done swift fox surveys for a few years and that's predominantly on private land. So just getting access to monitor species is really important. When we're going through and actually doing recovery efforts such as black-footed ferrets, we're putting those ferrets back out on private land. So working with individuals not only to monitor but to work with them to reestablish populations of species that were previously extirpated and we wouldn't be able to do any of that without the support of the landowners here in the state. Zach, we have a few minutes left. Um, tell me about your outreach, how you let people know what it is that you do and the education components that you offer here from your base in Lander. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of different programs. <coughs> so basically, um, we go to different local um, celebrations or fairs. We've done, used to do the expo, but we usually have booths. For example, here there's gonna be a, um, our bird biologist is going out and doing basically running a booth talking about wildscaping your backyard for birds. You know, so we have a lot of that. Um, and that's important even in a small, in a town or a city. Yes, yeah, exactly, because, you know, um, small modifications, you know, to people's, uh, the way people even handle their yards does help in some of these uh, bird populations. The, um, the other thing would be, you know, we're this fall, uh, Nicole and some uh, our other bat project biologist uh, will be doing spring into Yellowstone tours. Uh, so basically going up and capturing bats and f with the public and showing them exactly you know what they do, how we do it. Um, here last year uh, on the um, right outside of Lander, uh, we did a bat festival. Did, well, I'm sorry, what was it called? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, but anyway, it was a, a um, who would want to go to a bat festival is the, the question that yeah, I would ask. Yeah, I think it was it was part of like National Bat Week, and basically what it was asking is um, that we set up basically an educational site and we see look at the bats, and we had uh, different um, students from the community college here come out and watch us uh, trap bats, and you know we give lots of talks to Audubon. Um, programs not only for birds but for mammals as well. Uh, Nicole gave a presentation on wolverines just earlier uh, this year. The public wanted to understand more about the opportunities that they would have to either learn more or participate in your projects. Where can they go for information? Probably 
I guess the biggest thing would be to learn kind of what we do is probably at the Wyman Game Fish website and just to look to see um, what projects we have going on. But really to get probably better involved, the easiest way to do would be to contact the lander office or maybe even their local game and fish office and kind of see what opportunities might be in the area. Well, Zach Walker and Nicole Bjornley, thank you very much for joining us on Wyman Chronicle. Thank you. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Earlier in the program, Zach and Nicole talked about wolverines in Wyoming. And join us, joining us now on Wyoming Chronicle is Lee Taffelmeyer, the Wolverine Project biologist. Lee, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Thanks, Craig. Lee, you've spent a lot of time um, now surveying wolverines, um, just returned from um, checking hair snares. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your program and what it is that you do. So I'm working on the Wolverine proj Research Project. And this year, Wyoming's been tasked with surveying um, 25 grid cells for wolverine occupancy and what we've done is we've set up 25 camera stations in those grid cells in potential wolverine habitat and we've been maintaining rebating and checking those cameras once every month um, to see if they've detected wolverines um, so what we've done is we've set the cameras baited them and, and, and we've used these game cameras at each site and so on one tree we'll set up our game camera and then another tree about 46 meters away we'll put up a some sort of bait and scent lure and then below that we'll have a hair snare which is just a plastic collar with 30 caliber gun brushes attached to it to snag the hair of any animal that passes up the tree to get the bait. Um, what we've been using for bait this year has mostly been roadkill mule deer and so we'll, we'll collect roadkill mule deer with the help of Wyoming Department of Transportation and uh, we'll skin, skin the quarters and then pack them into the sites and attach them to the bait tree. Is this primarily in, in northwest Wyoming, Lee? Right, mm -hmm. it's primarily in the, in the mountain ranges of northwestern Wyoming. This winter we're surveying the southern, uh, southern half of our study area which has been kind of in the Jackson, Dubois, Pinedale, Alpine, and Lander areas in those associated mountain ranges. And then next winter, we're going to survey uh, further north, closer to Cody, Yellowstone National Park, and northern Grand Teton National Park, as well as a little bit in the Bighorn Mountain Range. And, and so, what have you found so far? Are there wolverines in Wyoming? I think a lot of people would want to know. Yeah, so there are wolverines in Wyoming. So far, three of our cameras have detected wolverines, um, which has been really exciting. Two of those cameras have been in the, in the Wind River mountain range, uh, one in the southeastern part of the range, and then one in the western part of the range. And then uh, most recently, we had a, a camera detect a wolverine in the southwestern Zorkas, north of Dubois. Is there any evidence that these are different wolverines, or could they be the same wolverine? It's, it's hard to tell um, right now, but uh, hopefully with the hair, the hair samples that we've collected, we'll be able to get a, a genetic analysis done and determine that 100% um, certainty whether they're different individuals or not. But based on the locations of the cameras and, and what the, the photos look like initially, it seems like each camera has detected a different individual. Is that a surprise? Uh, no, that's not a surprise based on the spacing of the cameras. Um, so like I said, it is possible that maybe the, the two cameras in the winds detected the same individual, but it's, it's more likely that they're different. What do you hope to learn from the DNA analysis of a wolverine? So you, you can learn a number of things. You can learn, first of all, the species, right? Confirm that this is a wolverine. And then you can identify its, its gender. So is this a male or female? Which can help um, tell you a lot about the picture of, of the species in that area. There's a, a, a big difference between detecting a, a male and a female. There's a lot of different information you get on that. And then um, also you can, you can look at more detailed stuff like genetic markers and, and, and relatedness to other populations in Montana or in Canada. So collecting a, hair, a, a sample of hair is, is pretty helpful. This is an interstate effort. Right. Yeah, this is a multi-state effort working in cooperation with Wyoming or Montana, Idaho, and Washington. Um, so it's going to be it's a, it's a very big project. Wyoming's playing a big role in a multi-state effort to look at wolverine distribution in the lower 48 and to really get a big picture 
idea of wolverine distribution across the lower 48. Have we um, been fairly certain there have been wolverines in Wyoming for quite a long time? Yeah, it's it's been known that wolverines have been in the state for quite a while, um, but really much more than that hasn't been known. So this is a good opportunity for the state to look at, um, take a closer look at wolverines in the entire state at, at, at you know a two-year period and gain a lot more information. You, you have some automated captures of wolverines and pictures. Right. Have you had any human sightings? And how do you how does the department uh, deal with information like that? Right. So. Um, Wyoming, uh, people on the project personnel haven't seen any wolverines with their own eyes uh, during this project, but uh, any, any information that we get from members of the public is really helpful as far as um, pinpointing where wolverines are within the state. Photos of tracks or actual wolverines can be very helpful. So if you get an encounter like that, it's good to report it. Bottom line question, Lee, and we just have a, uh, just a little bit of time left. Why is this important? Why is it important to study whether there are wolverines in Wyoming? Well, that's a good question, and it, it's, it's important because wolverines are a, a rare animal that, um, you know, there's not a lot known about them compared to other species. And so uh, they're a great resource that, for the state of Wyoming, and they're, they're a wild, charismatic animal that we don't have very much information as to their status. and. Um, and their location, specific locations throughout the state. So this, this information is going to be very helpful. The Tafelmeyer part of the Wyoming Game and Fishes non-game program, a Wolverine project biologist. Thanks for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you.